Hello and welcome to the latest edition of The Shindig, brought to you by the Red River Archaeology Group. I'm your usual host, Dr Tom Horn, and today we've got a spectacular episode for you. It's with Adam Parsons of Oxford Archaeology, and he's talking about Viking Age cemeteries. The burial practice itself, with all these grave goods within inhumation burials, some of the artefacts themselves, particularly the oval brooches, some of the axes and spears, tie these people very much to Scandinavian material culture. The main one we're going to focus on is the famous one from Cum Witten that was discovered by two metal detectors and was then excavated by Oxford Archaeology. As they were in the grave, as they were block lifted, you can see the shape of a, a, a semicircular horn, the preserved at home mount. So it's mounted on the top of a drinking horn and it was tinned and everything else. It's got spears, it's got swords, but it's got amber beads. It's got evidence for rugs and textiles. It's got strap ends. It's got everything you would want in a Viking cemetery. It was completely unknown, and now you're going to find out all about it. And more than that, you're going to discover about the amazing early medieval cemetery under St. Michael's in Workington, a burnt out church, and they discovered dozens and dozens of early medieval burials, including a very Viking one as well. Really odd either way you look at it. The past is a, a very strange place sometimes. Listen up and hopefully enjoy. Anyway, without without further ado, um, I'd like to talk about the Cum Witten Viking Cemetery and I'll let Adam just tell us from, you know, the, 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 the initial discovery and just a little bit about what what the site is and then we'll we'll do some fun stuff and we'll we'll focus on some specifics and some amazing patterns and connections that were emerging but just just set the scene for us people who don't know where come witten is uh they don't know what viking cemetery is and they have no idea how it was discovered so if you just go back if you sort of take us back in time could you just tell us a little bit about that please absolutely yeah i mean the, um the village of come tiny little village more of a hamlet really just a couple of miles to the south and east of carlisle a very northern tip of England in Cumbria and a metal detectorist Peter Adams and his friend George had been metal detecting this piece of land just on the periphery of Cumwit in the village and they'd, they'd rocked up this brooch um, they didn't really know what it was themselves they didn't even know it was a brooch particularly but they thought it was perhaps Victorian maybe even part of a tractor or something so they took it to their fines liaison officer which is obviously the responsible thing to do in England and the finds of the ages on officer got horrifically excited because it was a Viking Age oval brooch which is incredibly rare there were remains of the bits inside of it there was the remains of gilding on the surface they went back to the site and done a little bit more detecting and they found a second one now this was all held to break loose because obviously if you found a pair then that means that they're likely in a grave because they are worn in pairs together. You may get a single stray find, but if you find a pair together, that's highly likely. So Oxford Archaeology were eventually um, contacted by the Portable Antiquities Scheme to come and do some of the initial evaluations. I won't bore you with all the kind of in processes of the, of the ins and outs, but the short uh, version of it is that over the coming weeks, we discovered that, yes, there was indeed a burial here and... A metal detector survey of the surrounding area found some other artifacts including a sword hilt which meant either we had a really interesting burial with um, these oval brooches and a sword in which are very rarely found together or we had multiple burials and indeed we did have multiple burials in in total we found six burials um, spread over a small area on this hilltop um, one tight group of five very close together in two rows and then one kind of on its own on sort of the top of the hill which is the one which had the oval brooches in there so needless to say I other than perhaps Heathwood Cemetery near Repton I don't really think we've had a excavation of a Viking Age grave let alone cemetery in Britain since Adwickley Street in Yorkshire many years ago and even that was only a single burial so this was a genuinely unique opportunity to um, look at a Viking cemetery, albeit a fairly small one, in the whole using modern techniques, modern analysis and, and things like that. And that's kind of what we did really over the subsequent weeks of excavation and obviously subsequent years of analysis and everything else. What I'd like to maybe at this point is um, we'll just talk through maybe the individual burials, mm -hmm. one, one to six. 
Um, but if you're watching this on uh, on uh, YouTube round about now, you will see those uh, burials appear. But otherwise, you can you know if you're listening to us in the audio, you can you can you can Google it, and we'll talk about the Cumberton publication uh, later. But if we're standing there on this on this field now and say they've all been uh, exposed at the same time, they've still got all their their finds there. What am I seeing from, from one to six? And how are they, how do we know that they're they're Viking? They're not you know just sort of Anglo Saxons about a couple of Viking things. Or I know there's not really much skeletal ed- evidence, but what are the sort of combinations of artifacts that make you think okay these are either first or second generation Viking or Scandinavian settlers in, in Cumbria? Yeah, well, so as you said, we only had a tiny piece of the back of a skull in the first grave, the one with the oval brooches. Um, and there was no, we tried to do analysis at several labs. There was just not enough collagen or anything else left in the bone to do any work with. So as you say, we were left entirely on artifacts, which is a real shame because there's just nothing certain you can say about the sex of the individuals in there. So you're left kind of trying to interpret gender through the lens of artifacts which it's always risky the probability lies on your side but it's always something you can never be certain about so in the first grave we had those oval brooches and we had uh, the remains of a bead somewhere up near the head as well just below one of the oval brooches we had a key and the remains of a knife handle with wooden wooden handle with the iron tang with silver wires wrapped around it in a, a decorative pattern and then nothing else in that grave until below the feet in the grave um, and that is to say the grave was a good in excess of seven feet long um, so below where we suspect the feet would have been um, the remains of what turned out to be a box now I'll have some images that uh, hopefully Luke can put up which is what we did with this box because it was just a corroded lump of um, iron um, it was frozen in dry ice and lifted as a block and because this was a historic England funded project they were going to do a lot of conservation work in conjunction with us and so they took those all down to Fort Cumberland and micro excavated that block in the lab having x-rayed it all first which meant we were able to recover a lot of material uh, from the block which you know gave us an insight and may well have been missed on site because some of it did not even survive excavation it was so fragile you could see it on the x-ray but there was just dust there when we actually got down to it um, but this box basically turned out to be a fancy lock plate with lots of iron brackets all over it and it contained inside of it a glass slick stone a um, piece of glass about eight centimeters in diameter a spindle whirl uh, the remains of some shears and possibly some other objects too um, again we on the x-ray you can see bits of needles and things like that but very difficult to work out one cool thing from sort of the modern techniques we used by block lifting we preserved a lot of the remains that were stuck on the outside of the box itself and they were able to identify these in in the lab as being the remains of folded textiles placed in the grave next to the box which means you know these blank areas we often get on grave plans your brain kind of thinks well what was there well in this instance we can say that there was at least pieces of folded textiles so they may have been expensive blankets or sheets or additional clothes which when you understand just how much labor goes into making a piece of clothes you can imagine that would be a just as worthy a grave gift as a brooch or something else would be a, you know a piece of clothing that perhaps had that much effort into it yep. so there may well have been other things in the grave as well um as well as fabrics such as you know food stuff like that perishable things it's one of those things you know we've got so many spaces in graves and you know up until now it's been difficult we've always been guessing at stuff but this is you know using these sorts of techniques has enables us to glimpse little bits of you know stuff that may have been in there that we previously had speculated could have been but now we've actually got some proof of it which is always pretty cool and i think it was with this you know we'll go into other graves in a moment but it wasn't it with uh this first grave is it grave one we're talking about yeah yes yeah that um with the box it was actually sort of uh block lifting use of x-rays i mean over over the whole site but with this one allowed you to see things that were as the title of your fantastic book is called you know essentially just shadows in in the sand yeah, yeah. i mean for a start the bodies were just that as well you know but yeah exactly you it was the it was the needles particularly in this that were sad which are quite clear on x-ray you can see them there with a the little eyelet and everything else but you know when we got 
football rather when the conservators got to actually excavating them they were really just powder you know powder that had been preserved in the shape of what they were but there was nothing for them to try and recover or keep together so you just ended up with crumbs but you know again because of this technique we got to keep the form of the objects and that allowed us to use the x-rays and to use some reconstruction drawings again which is where that comes in to you know put these things together in a, a holistic way so you could see what the objects were and what the graves may have looked like when they were you know first put down there by the people who were burying their their, their loved ones the deceased the x-rays and the block lifting particularly in combination allowed you to know what was there um so that you're not I mean, no one goes in blindly in these things, particularly with micro-excavation, but you knew roughly the diameters, you knew the depth, so that it, it allowed you to get out what was there rather than, you know, we've all found essentially stains. You can see something that's a stain, say, if you're doing sandy soil, and I've done it myself. It's something that looks like a perfect large bit of iron. You think, oh, that's very interesting. And you photograph it because you think, well, it's sandy soil. We don't know the conditions in and then when you start to move it, it just crumbles into some orange sand. And all you've got are the photos and maybe a couple of bits of, of corrosion. But that that this technique really allowed you, particularly presumably with the with the metal as well as the the, the bone pins you were talking about, um, you know, actually just plan and your know, commercial is we've we've got, you know, we have to do things in a certain time, but we still have to do it to the, the high standards, don't we? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's always the most important thing. And yeah, we one like, particularly good example is a drinking horn mount now there are actually two horn mounts found at Cumwitten, but one of them um, which is in the second grave so i may as well s slide smoothly yeah. onto the second yeah. grave, <laughs> um, um was found sort of towards what we think would be the lower left hand side of the interred person's body so up in the head area and there was a, a collection of objects up there which were all piled on top of each other and had all corroded into one big lump um, within that, there was a comb, a sickle, and some shears all fused together. Now, the comb had completely gone, but the rivets were preserved. And the corrosion product had kind of exploded around the comb and made a Pompeii-style silhouette of the comb. So we didn't have the comb, but we had a hollow that showed the shape and the decoration of the comb, which was really wow. cool. Wow, now, we wouldn't have got cool. that, but you wouldn't have got that by digging on site, for example. You know, so um, you'd you'd have, you know entire no fault at all of the digger but you would have traveled through that because of what it was but as you said you know the x-ray allowed that in addition to that there was two objects sort of north and south of this cluster towards the head um which when excavated don't look very much really but when you see them as they were in the grave as they were block lifted you can see the shape of a a, a semicircular horn the preserved at home mount so it's mounted on the top of a drinking horn and it was tinned and everything else. And we were able to confirm it was indeed that because there was a tiny piece of horn left in between the metal that had been preserved by the mineral salts leaching out of it. So we had this little bit of horn mount. Again, the piece itself was, you know, not much to make out, but the X-ray allowed us to see the form of the full horn mount. And then about 25, 30 centimetres away, there was a little spherical terminal, um, which linking back to your original question about how do we know these were scandinavians well we don't 100 percent, but this one the only real good parallels for it are in norway as a drinking horn mouth in norway and as we looked throughout the whole cemetery we found that that was a pattern and you know that kind of spread throughout them all that the burial practice itself with all these grave goods within inhumation burials some of the artifacts themselves uh, particularly the oval brooches, some of the axes and spears, tie these people very much to Scandinavian material culture. Now, whether that means that they themselves were adopters of this culture or immigrants themselves, unfortunately, because we've got no skeletons, we just can't say for certain. But there was a strong influence there. But there were also other elements, such as some textiles and things like that and some other artifacts and some of the decorative schemes and some of the artifacts which tied them very much to the region now whether that's western scotland ireland or northwest england it's difficult to say because material culturally in that period it's a bit of a soup isn't it you know we've got a you know lots of things that could be very similar on the western isles and cumbria you know um because that's the that's the nature of material culture in that time you know a, the islands of Britain and Ireland 
are sort of divided up slightly differently when your primary modes of transport or your fast and easy modes of moving large things around is a boat as compared to a motorway and a car. You know, that sort of changes the geography of the way you look at it a little bit. But we found some of those textiles in grave number two as well. So this grave had a buckle and a strap end found near the waist area. Now, the strap end had a piece of textile survived on the back. And again, uh, the textile specialist who looked at it was seeing some traditions of textile work in a lot of these textiles that seemed to tie some of them to traditions that were going on in Britain and Ireland at the time. And in other textiles, uh, ways of spinning the cloth, basically, that were more reflective of those that were going on in Scandinavia. Now, none of this is an absolute science, but it it does seem to pick up on a pattern throughout a number of things that come with and where we have this hybridized culture which has got a little bit of foot in one camp and a little bit of a foot in another camp now whether that's something as we interpreted as perhaps first generation settlers who with things like clothes that wear out they are replacing them locally as and when they wear out or perhaps even not when they wear it just in the latest fashions and indeed other objects such as the belts and things that maybe they're you know adopting some local cultural traditions or whether it means they're a, a further generation on or, or just local people who are adopting some of the incoming fashions. We don't honestly know. That's the truth. But the buckle was even more interesting than the strap end itself in that underneath the the buckle plate. So there's a metal plate that kind of attaches the buckle to the belt. But underneath that, there were a load of fibers. And uh, when the specialists looked at these fibers under the microscope, uh, they identified this as being seal skin which is really, really unusual. Um, it's got a particular sort of pattern to the, once you get right down into a microscopic view, it's got a particular pattern to it, which um, often means you can distinguish different animal types from each other. Um, to my knowledge, we've not really had evidence of seal skin being used on things like this before. Now, whether that was a belt made of seal skin or whether it was perhaps an overgarment being worn of seal skin, um, we weren't 100% sure, but... Um, Either way, it was just another example of, you know, this kind of modern forensic and scientific sort of techniques that you can throw at material these days to kind of eke out every little last bit of detail. Really cool. And the only other thing... Wasn't it, grave... I mean, just just on yeah. on on that point, because I'd, I, I would, I'd hate to be missed because of the material that you, the, the, that you sent me, the the thing I think captured my imagination. You saw my notes. I I wanted to talk about the seal skin because that's. <laughs> I, mean, we could have a pod, I think we could have a podcast just on that, and probably a podcast on you know, corrosion products and and the preservation of mineralized uh, textiles. But the thing that really struck my imagination was the the setting of the graves, and I think you you could see, and I'll I'll let you paint paint the picture, and we'll have some images coming up as well for for YouTube viewers. That they were laid on oak uh, planks, and mm -hmm. they then there was sort of a fleece laid over that for some of the graves. And this is quite interesting because that links in a little bit to when we had the the podcast recently uh, with uh, Dr. Emma Brownlee, who was talking about bed burials and this idea of of comfort. And you really get that sense of you know there's there's a family that are burying the rest of their family, and you want them to be you want them to be comfortable. Um, yeah, yeah. And so you still thought a little bit about that particular find with with the the fleece. Yeah, I mean, this we we reconstructed some of this from a, multiple bits in the grave. Some had staining in uh, a grave. I'll talk about later. Grave number four had some really good evidence for the actual wooden beer that they must have been laid on or, or lining. But this one, it's the strap end of this particular belt set was actually found slightly over to one side of where we would expect it to be if it was very close to the belt buckle. And it seems to have been lying perhaps on the floor of the burial with perhaps the dress or the garment that the person was wearing over the top because the actual fabric obscures the pattern on the strap end. So it suggests perhaps the strap end was on a, a, long, a longer length of, of leather. The belt would be cinched around the waist with the buckle and then the strap end would fall to one side and that the cloth garment had fallen over the top of it. But that meant that this strap end was lying on what the body was lying on. So we found underneath the strap end fleece, the remains of some compacted um, sheep fleece. And then, as you say, little bits of oak. So and this wasn't the only place where we were detecting this sort of at the base of the grave. So it generally looked like they were being laid 
you know, on some sort of wooden, in some instances, oak, either beer, you know, like a big square board. It may have been the graves were lined with it. We don't know, but um, certainly on that. And then on fleeces, but then if you take grave number one, were there then other textiles laid around them? There's some evidence elsewhere that they may have been wrapped in a shroud, um, which doesn't have to have been a sort of, you know, fine linen specific wrapping. It could have been their cloak or their blanket that they used in in, the, in life or that had been put there by the family or the friends. So we do start to see with just these little tiny bits of information, we do start to reconstruct sort of the grave and, and the funerary tradition. Um, and it's not the only grave we have little glimpses of that where it's people actually thinking about the process of what to put in the grave, what order to put in the grave, how to display it, how to, you know, how to bury this individual. And like you said, the comfort element's one of those. Yeah, you actually, that, that, yeah. I was going to say, from grave number one, the oval brooch, we had some quite interesting bits of fly pupa on the inside of it which suggested that the body may have been interred for several weeks because these have a, a life cycle of these things hatching, which suggests that, you know, the brooch has been put on the dead body long enough and the body had been displayed for a period of time long enough, which would have been several days or possibly even a week or so, for these things to go through a life cycle inside of the brooch itself, which tells us a little bit about this being an extended funeral tradition, you know, this body had been clearly prepared for this funeral and laid out for this funeral. So it's all part of that piecing together little bits of these people's behavior and, you know, their, their attitudes towards death and burial. And it may have been, they had to gather people from roundabout for a funeral and organize a funeral in the same way we do today. If somebody dies, you cannot bury them immediately. You've got to make phone calls. Well, you know, presumably they couldn't to a phone call was, jumping on the horse and galloping a few miles around to let people know and to gather them all to an event such as this. So. Yeah, if you're strong, if your family, your extended family is strong out, you know, between the, the, the Irish Sea, the Irish Sea region is one of the, this mixed region that we're kind of talking about that, that Cumbria phases on to, but your whole family mm -hmm. might be on valleys or stretching towards Yorkshire and York. And yeah, as, as Adam's mm -hmm. suggesting that, yeah, you, you've got to, You've got to tell people, and yeah, maybe there's prestige that the longer that you, you're displayed as, as as some sort of relation to how important you 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 were. And I think you know what 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 we traditionally would have thought on moving on to the the next set of graves. You know what we you know again in the, the days when we sort of you know we thought that weapons burials were the the most important. You you've certainly got what traditionally an antiquarian would have been very excited uh, and probably forgotten about the other graves. But they would have been very excited by the the next three graves. So if you could maybe mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the graves uh, three, four, and and five now, obviously starting yeah, definitely. with three. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, just to sort of finish off that last one, those first two, because of the jewellery, I mean, the last one had some beads and some finger rings and silver finger rings and also a very, very small um, oil shale arm ring in it. I mean, those three looked gendered very much towards the female sphere of the Viking world with large numbers of jewellery, particularly these oval brooches, which are characteristic of a sort of dress that Scandinavian women wore. But the next three are very much martial weapon burials. Again, we can't really tell the gender of them. And the first one's quite an interesting one, grave number three, in that it's got a sword in it, which is very cool. Um, all the swords were pattern welded at Cumwitten, which you know people think is really interesting at sighting, but it may be that at this period... And we think the burials are probably late 9th, 10th century. But at this period, we suspect that pattern welding is kind of going out of fashion. So these swords may be putting, put in the graves as the kind of, you know, the last generation of cars, so to speak, you know, because people aren't driving them anymore. Um, but in addition to the sword, there seem to have been some buckles near the knees, which may have been related to garters or spurs. So as a, a, a sort of part of this kind of equine you know, horse riding culture. Um, and it had a few objects near the waist, which was a sort of little razor folding knife type thing, a separate knife, normal knife, um, and some flints and a striker light. So it's like a little fire lighting and utility kit there. And then up at the neck, uh, a large number of beads, particularly for a, a weapon burial. So there are a number of glass beads, an amber bead and three different silver rings which I've recently made a reproduction of, so I could uh, send you a picture of that to put up there so you can sort of see the this thing. And that's quite unusual. Again, 
how you interpret that it's difficult to know it could be that it's just a somebody who you know liked a lot of beads um so it's 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 very difficult to sort of without some osteological data to say anything really meaningful about this sort of the graves themselves but we normally assume that graves with weapons in them are leaning towards the masculine sphere of society but we've had a number of quite high profile sites and graves in Scandinavia, Norway and, and Sweden, where we've found bodies that are clearly osteologically female or appear to be with weapons in too. So we have to always be really careful about imposing too much of our worldviews one way or the other on the past. We can only, re as archaeologists, we can only really try and think about it from a societal level and stop you know, stop trying to concentrate too much on the individual from that perspective, really, and just try and look at the metrics of it, really, because we don't know enough about the, the the person themselves. So, grave. If I go to grave number four, because that's one that sort of it was right next to grave number three. Again, it had a sword in it, but this one was much more of a military-looking character in that it had a sword, but it also had an axe, a spear, and a shield. So the only one in the entire cemetery with a shield. Other than that, there was a belt, um, very little else, a single bead, I think. Um, so it's much more of this kind of military projection, I suppose. Um, the shield boss looks very much like Scandinavian ones at the time. So this really does, as does the axe itself. It's a type E axe, but it's very much the sort of axe you would expect on a lot of the large Scandinavian inhumation and boat burials throughout Norway and Scotland and places like that. So it fits very much into that tradition. The interesting thing about the axe is it, it just like grave number two it sort of gives us a little zoomed in view on the burial practice itself because the axe had actually been thrust directly into the board at the foot of the grave axe first so somebody has slammed it down with a lot of power so it's stuck directly into the board so it's straight upright and then the wow. spearhead the spearhead had been balanced on the butt of the axe so this would require some sort of thought and some idea behind what they were doing and why and it makes you think well was the axe slammed down there when the body was in the grave because that's quite a powerful and symbolic act that person's lying in the grave bang so we've tried it you know we've experimented with it with axe and you need to slam it with your full body weight to get it to stick in there nice and firmly to stand up but then it requires the delicate balancing of the spear on the butt of it so you know again we don't know why but it's really interesting to see these thought patterns and these processes and you know what they think they might be doing um which is yeah odd 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 but exciting at the same time well that's why i always, I always say that you know uh, i think i was saying to you the other week when uh we were um i spent i spent a weekend in, in your company and we'll, we'll maybe uh, we'll talk about that a, a bit later but um you could meet someone from the past and I think 90% of the day you would think, oh, this person's absolutely brand new, really decent, really nice, chat yeah. away to them. And then they would just do something we would find completely inexplicable, probably very <laughs> yes. violent, very quick. And they would not, you get the sense that they would be like, oh, I, I don't understand your problem. And then they would continue talking away and you'd be like, okay, so the past is not a foreign country for probably 90% of the time, but there's that 10% where there's that worldview that, you know, you say you can recreate that. So we get an idea that it's a deliberate action with the act, which I think is one of the most mm -hmm. fascinating, the way you describe it, absolutely most one of the most fascinating things I've ever heard mm -hmm. in, in Viking, in Viking archaeology. But beyond that, yeah, we just don't know that moment of what that meant. No. Um, yeah. And, yeah. So, but yeah. Sorry, I I absolutely interrupted just because I I just needed to say words about that amazing act <laughs> and the spear balance. Um, but there there's another spear. Um, and there's obviously you might want to finish off on four, but um, there's there's more spears to to come, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, really, that's there are some other little bits in that grave, but that's largely it. It's very much a, this kind of military imposing kind of thing. Obviously, with something like that, we also wonder whether you know whether it's you think about the circumstances of the burial so there may be that the as well as family members at funerals there may well be other members of society who knows whether there's overlords being invited whether there's tenant farmers whether there's other local landlords being invited so that it may be some of the objects in these graves are put in there by those people or it may be that the family puts them in there but they're trying to send messages out to other members in the community so for example 
if there's a period of unrest and instability, it may be that this family is trying to signal with this particular burial to the members of the community. Remember, we are protectors. We have protected you in the past. You know, the, so the calls could be all sorts of other messages in here. So and often people tend to read graves as this person was a warrior. But we may have to think a little bit more around the box about these sort of things of, well, maybe this person was a warrior, but maybe also this family was trying to remind other families and other people in the community that they are a family that protects people and it just so happens that this event was the one that that message was you know put across on um grave number five seems to be the Ooh. biggest one in the cemetery um it appears to have had a ditch dug around it which suggests it might have had a little mound on top of it and it's also got it's the biggest grave and it's also got the most objects within it um again a sword um spear things like that um a bead the usual brooch uh, ringed pins for you know closing cloaks and garments the usual set of little bits of accoutrements near the waist folded knives and things like that but it also had a weird little collection of uh of esoteric objects as well so, so like a little tiny piece of mica that had been one millimeter thick cut into a centimeter perfect circle i have absolutely no idea what it is and the only parallel i've found is a as a clothing a, a decoration in Birka in Sweden, uh, where it was found inside some posaments down the edge of some sort of garment. So really odd little things like that. There was also um, a Roman bead in there and a coin, I think, from memory too, like a, which was an older coin. Um, so that kind of suggests that, I don't know, I, I kind of joked at the time that this was the, a, a Viking Age archaeologist because he'd clearly been picking up Roman things and there was a Bronze Age flint in there as well. So he'd obviously been picking up, you know, making his own little micro antiquarian collection and that had been stuck in a little pouch with him when they buried him. So again, I've got to show my own bias there by saying it's a him too because we don't actually know. Um, again, we, we sort of interpret these things through this lens of the the weapons and things like that, but uh, we just we just don't know. One thing that was really cool, in addition to the weapons and stuff like that, was the fact that, again, this one had another drinking horn, this time with a much larger mount on the top, with some really crude interlace incised on it and some large bossed uh, caps. And that's something I'll come on to this kind of metalworking technique towards the end a little bit, because it kind of sums up some of the interesting bits about the cemetery and about things like that. But as well as the drinking horn, there was also a large chain and a hook, which is for suspending a cauldron and cooking things above the fire and a large seax with a horn handle and silver inlay on it, which, you know, they may well have been associated with hunting, um, a large hunting knife. So we've got this kind of idea in this grave that there's these things for feasting and cooking and, and hunting and things like that. So it's showing very much this kind of ideas of providing, you know, from a food drink point of view for the community too. So once we start thinking about that lens of what messages could this be sending out, this might be a, you know, I am the provider kind of person or, or maybe just because of the size of the grave and everything else, maybe trying to state some level of importance. Maybe it's showing the person's importance or maybe it's trying to project a sense of importance. Who knows which. Um, and lastly, sadly, grave number six, it's always a bit of a disappointment. And I feel sadly for the person in it, because I think it was probably a better grave than was preserved. But unfortunately, it was on one side of the cemetery and the bedrock kind of cut through it. So it was a bit shallower than the others. And that meant a lot of the objects seemed to have been pulled out of the grave by the, the plough itself, ploughing the field over the, the centuries. So there was a spearhead, again, a belt buckle and a knife, I think, preserved in that grave but very little else, unfortunately. Um, however, scattered around that grave in the soil, we found the remains of the sword hilt, which I mentioned earlier on, and bits of sword blade. We found some more bits of ringed pin. We found bits of beads. We found bits of folding knives. We found additional spearheads and things. We even found another large knife, which may have been a similar sax. So it's entirely possible that this grave was much more like the others and quite a prestigious one but we can't we couldn't really associate it with that particular grave the final most yeah. intriguing point was that we had a yeah. a, a, a bird owl brooch in the plough soil smashed into multiple pieces scattered throughout the cemetery now that's another form of oval brooch just like the one in grave number one 
There only seems to have been one from the fragments we found, but it was not complete, so maybe there were two. And the interesting thing about bird owl brooches is they are an awful lot older than the rest of the cemetery. So this could be well over 100 years old, maybe more than the time of the cemetery. So we're kind of puzzled with that one a little bit. Again, because it's a plough soil find, we couldn't associate it with a grave, but you know, maybe that belonged to grave number two. Maybe these were heirloom brooches. Maybe it was included in one of the other graves as some kind of keepsake or something. But even once we'd looked at the graves in and of themselves, there were there was these other little tantalizing glimpses from the plough soil finds that suggests, you know, this bigger picture even than we were able to recover. Um the plow, plow giveth and the plow taketh away, I suppose. <laughs> yep. Um, and, so. and, and just, just, you know, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish your point, but... Um, no, no, that was it. That was it. I, I, you, you're talking about, you know, there's some aspects, some of the graves have got more information in them and not, but when you've done really interesting work, um, you know, you, you and Oxford Archaeology in terms of looking at these in concert and then seeing some patterns between the the graves and potentially even a sort of family link across some of the graves. I don't know if you could just expand upon that for our listeners and and viewers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing that sort of started me looking at it was looking at the belts because the belts all seem to have been, they're, they're a little bit different in style, but they all seem to have been manufactured using very similar techniques. And it's a weird technique that kind of involves the general style and morphology of belts you might find in southern and eastern England, so in the Dane law in Denmark in southern England. But actually the decoration and the techniques used to make them are much more similar to belt styles in Ireland, in Scotland, in this kind of northwestern insular world. And these were an unusual kind of cut and shut um, of, this, of these two sort of cultures. Whether you think that's somebody who was used to making belts in a certain style had asked them, had been asked to make them, you know, like they make them over in Yorkshire, for example, or whether it's somebody who was used to making belts like that had been asked to use these decorative techniques over there, who knows? But it's it's really interesting in that the site itself is kind of on the junction of these two worlds and the belts kind of reflect that too. And there were basically four of these graves that had belts that probably belonged to this tradition in them. Um, which kind of links them together as a a fairly close group. Whether it's familial or not, it's difficult to know, but, I mean, they're such a close group that it's fairly reasonable to argue that they may have been related in some way, you know, some sort of family kin group, however extended that was, or whether it was, you know, based on marriage as well as other things. But these belts definitely tie them to the region and also tie, you know, tie them to the two worlds i guess they straddled in geographically where they're situated to 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 finish off what you're talking about these wider links and things being on these liminal border spaces between these sort of Irish, maybe this irish sea and and uh, anglo-saxon world with this sort of world of the sort of scandinavian incomers that may have been there by a generation or two um by by then what, what was your kind of your sort of closing thought of the book of what this cemetery, as you say, it's a absolutely unique, and brilliantly excavated site. Um, so you get the advantages of that. You didn't get obviously uh, any skeletal remains that you could take um, uh, uh, take any readings from. But what what was it you think telling you about this? You know, this I, I think you talk about it in, in, in your publications, uh, and there's uh, uh, the ar- um, current archaeology article um, with with Rachel. Um, you 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 talk about this sort of wider what it's telling us about this picture of the the tenth century in in northwest England uh, England and in, in Cumbria. What what was kind of your your takeaway from from that? Yeah, well, I said I mean obviously we published the book twenty fourteen uh, ten years afterwards, but it's one of those things that I don't think we'll ever stop mining for potential information because this work continues to go on. But one thing we said then, and I think it still holds true, is that we started looking exactly as you say at these liminal spaces about these cultures, and it 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 focuses away from the sort of the English perspective, which is the modern world, into a more um, and away from even the Scandinavian perspective, thinking about these things as Vikings and very and more into what is the space these people occupied, what other cultures, what other societies were interacting with that. Um, in a genuine sense, you know, what does 
Irish Scandinavian material look like? What does Irish material look like? What does material in Scotland look like? What cultures are there in Scotland at the time interacting with this place? And and that was our takeaway, really, is we started looking at Cumbria, not just as a, a, a place that belonged to, you know, Anglo-Saxon Northumbria, and not just as a place that was inhabited by Scandinavians, but what other cultures were there interacting with that time and that space. And that led us on to um, researching the Kingdom of Strathclyde. Um, it led us on to looking at Gaelic speakers in the, in the area. And through those research routes and avenues, discovering a whole lot more about, you know, how this place could be interpreted and the the relationships going on with the individuals buried here. And that, that leads us on perfectly to your your other work on an, another early medieval uh, cemetery. Um, and I'll, I'll just let you, you talk. So we're talking about St. Michael's Church in Workington, which had a, a fairly catastrophic fire. Mm -hmm. And um but you know there's 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 sadly there's opportunity um or, or good news that there's opportunity that it allowed you to investigate uh, a site that was already known from i think 8th to 11th century uh carved mm -hmm. stones um but you know what we're interested here i suppose is, is how that relates to the, the 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 cemetery the christian cemetery i think as as we, mm -hmm. as we think of it that was found underneath the, the body of the modern church yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the actual fire the church itself burnt down in the mid 90s and there was some work carried out there by Carlisle Archaeology uh, Limited, who were the place, uh, who, uh, the company who excavated them at the time and um, now sadly defunct. And they excavated uh, numerous burials in and around the footprint of the church um, because obviously the entire interior was gutted. It's not often you get to dig up the interior of a church, really. So, again, it's, as you say, it's sad, but also a really unique opportunity. There were a number of graves there that were clearly dating to the early medieval period from a start just because of some of the artefacts and some additional stone sculpture was found during these excavations too, which added to the corpus that you'd mentioned already. Um, now, this work kind of, obviously, when Carla Archaeology Limited went under, this work kind of sat in limbo for a little while until we took the work up um, a, a few years ago now, and and dis, and yes. were asked to complete the post excavation program. So that was my responsibility. Was largely with a colleague of mine, John, was writing up the report itself and and analysing some of the finds. And of course, Caroline, who had worked on with Cumwitten, had written those finds, finds reports. She was involved again in in, in that aspect. Um, what we found out was that there was a two phases of early medieval cemetery there. One that was incredibly early. Um, dating to the sort of 7th, 8th centuries, a number of burials there lined along a really unusual ditch that ran sort of north, east, south, west. And then a later phase of cemeteries, which of cemetery, which appeared to be clustered around um, a small area, which was near where the south door of the medieval church was, but we didn't find any remains of any structures there, irritatingly. Um, these seem to be very end of the 10th, but early 11th century in a very tight group in fact the radiocarbon um, specialist said he'd never seen such a tight grouping of radiocarbon dates he thought it may have been a period of burial that was kind of 30 years long something like that um it could have been a little bit longer but it was it was really quite interesting and these were all buried in kists now the early ones weren't they were just laid in the ground or in wooden coffins um some of them with hinges and locks on which was a kind of northumbrian tradition but the later ones were all laid in kists and these stone slab lintel style burials so there's clearly something really unusual went on there and that there was this earlier site that perhaps associated with the North Umbrian sculpture that had been going on for a number of years, fairly stable community, um, a fairly adult heavy community, although we had um, individuals that were sexed both as male and female there. So it seems to be in a, a fairly even community that point of view, but not a lot of children, although there were some. Whereas this later community is much more of a balanced community. It looks more more children, more adolescents and things like that. Um, but then they're all in this tight group, all aligned true east-west instead of the funny angle. So something went on in the end of the 10th century that caused this site to completely reorientate itself, completely change its burial practices for a very short period of time. And then by the middle of the 10th century, uh, middle of the 11th century, it seems to go again. Um, so it's a really interesting one because it's tied with this sculpture as well. And there seems to be sculptural phases that associate with each of these. 
Um, again, we sort of inter interpreted it similarly in to Cumwitten in that there was a sort of Northumbrian community there, perhaps monastic, because there was previous evidence of a building stone with an Anglo-Saxon name on it. Um, it is mentioned in some historical sources as being a, a you know, a, a probable ecclesiastical site. But then in the 11th century, perhaps it becomes a parish church and perhaps because of the volume of Scandinavian style sculpture coming in there, that this is something that maybe a local noble uh, family takes over the patronage of this church and pays for this sculpture. Um, and that is a, during the mid to latter half of the 10th century, which means when they all die at the end of the 10th and 11th century, they expect a nice fancy burial outside the door of a, of a church that they've paid for. <laughs> And they go in in these lovely kissed burials, you know, and, and introduce this tradition there then. So they may well be the sort of descendants of Cumwitten, so to speak. Cause it's only, you know, 15, 20 miles away. Not literally the same family, but mm. they are the, the sort of next iteration of that burial practice. Because there was one burial near Workington discovered a number of years ago at West Seaton, which appears to have been a bent and folded Typex sword just a couple of miles over the river. So it may have been that there were more of these burials around Cumbria. We do know of a number as well as Cumwitten along this north Solway plain. But it may have been that there was one at Workington too and that, you know, eventually that family becomes powerful in the local area and, and adopts this new thing. And the way of showing your power in the mid to later 10th century is no longer by chucking things in the grave with, you know, everything else. It's by paying for expensive sculpture at the local church because a lot of this sculpture does have, um, you know, Scandinavian-style ornament on it. Some of them have a figure riding a serpent, which is... It could be interpreted as a number of things, but there's lots of strong candidates within Norse mythology for that sort of thing. So, yeah, we've got a really interesting site there, too, in that it may be the sort of next step in that process of Scandinavian acculturation within the local community. Um, one really interesting thing um, about the one of the graves here is that it's, there's actually perhaps some ties to sites like Cumwitten, in that we called it Grave 196 because that was the order it was dug in. And uh, it was a Osteologically, it appeared to be a female, middle-aged female, but it was dated somewhere between sort of 700 and 900, likely biased towards the end of that. So we're looking mid to late 9th century. Um, the person was wearing a belt, a buckle and strap end, and the strap end had Bora style ring chain all down it decoration. In addition, there was a knife, a wet stone and a sickle found within the grave. Now, of course, within Christian cemeteries, you do get clothes and things like that being worn, but whetstones knives and sickles are kind of stretching that a little bit so it's quite heavily furnished for christian cemetery but a, perhaps a little bit under furnished for something else so it sort of sits in that period at the end of the ninth century where you think what's going on there really but it's this kind of tantalizing glimpse particularly when you put it in context with the fact that this is likely the period that Aspatria, which is only a few miles away, and Cumwitten and Heskett and perhaps even West Seaton, there are burials going in this Solway Plain, and perhaps there's something at St Michael's, despite this, um, you know, very clearly Christian and perhaps even um, ecclesiastical monastic site there, there's some alteration in burial practice there that seems to accommodate this furnished inhumation tradition a little bit. One benefit we also had from St. Michael's is that we had bones, which, you know, wasn't the case at, at Culwitton. Um, most of the graves had skeletal remains, and the early ones were slightly poorly preserved, but um, the later ones were pretty good. And one of the really interesting ones, right slap bang in that kissed grave group of that family group, um, was an adult man, um, and he'd kind of had a bit of an interesting and traumatic-looking life anyway. He had these um, clear signs of arthritis and things like that, as people often did in the period, so it wasn't necessarily in the best shape. Slightly unusual asymmetrical face, although we are talking West Cumbria in the 9th century, so I don't know what we might expect. <laughs> it's, it's a fairly rough place even today. <laughs> um, you can say that being from there. I'll just say uh, that now. Adam my family's old. from there. It's fine. I'm, it's, a, it's an <laughs> own goal, that one of my friends. <laughs> Um, he'd also sustained a number of really interesting injuries, and in he seems to have had a parry fracture on his left forearm. 
So it's got a fracture there, which looks very much like a peri fracture, like as if he blocked a blow. And then a subsequent fracture on his elbow that appears to have been a fall onto a hard surface. So as if he'd, he'd been hit and then fallen and fractured his elbow, and um, which implies some kind of interpersonal violence. Um, but these had healed, or at least partially healed, by the time he died. Um, now, we don't know the exact manner of his death, but there are there are either some clues as to the manner of his death or the manner in which his body was treated after his death. We don't really know which. Certainly what did happen was that somebody had stuck a long bladed implement into his upper chest right the way through to the point where it, it stuck into his spine several times in a close group up here. Now, this is unlikely to be combat because there's such a tight group of stabbing that to be that accurate with a moving target is almost impossible. So this kind of puts it into a couple of uh, potential um, answers. One being that this person was either asleep or being held down and had been murdered, likely with something like a spear point, because when you look at the depth of body cavity it has to go through, that's a good six inches plus of material it has to get through. And it appears to have cut both sides of the blade, which suggests something double-sided. Well, at that period, saw blade is too wide. Um, knife blades only have one edge on them, so it's got to be something like a spear blade. And that's gone right in. It had severed his clavicle, it had, uh, bits of his manubrium, so the bone down here had been sort of damaged by the attack. And it had gone right the way through and, and stuck in his third or fourth thoracic vertebra on his back. Um, so it might have been a, a murder while the person was asleep or being held down. Um, the other potential thing is that certainly in, in the 12th century, it became very common sh sh sort of shortly after post, uh, after death to remove the heart from the body and keep that separately. So, for example, it's particularly common in the church. And so they would you know, literally cut the heart out of the chest. So it may be that it's a heart ablation, something like that, too. But either way... Uh, it's another one of those things like come with the axes and the other things. It's another one of those details that kind of just come a little bit out of left field. Really. <laughs> either way, either way, you know, it's either a murder in which case you're like, what? Or it's, it's a weird heart ablation. Um, it, it, you know, one of the churches in Dublin still has a, uh, a heart in today, actually from the I think 12th or 13th century, one of the uh, ecclesiastical figures there. And it's, it's on display in this casket and it was quite common to do stuff like that. So, Really odd either way you look at it. The past is a, a very strange place sometimes. But as you say, we um, we had a num we had you know a, a really excellent collection of stone sculpture. One of the pieces of stone sculpture was actually found in a grave as well, which means for the first time ever we've got a date for the body in the grave and a date for the sculpture with it, which is an early 11th century date. So it's rare that you get anything other than our yeah. stylistic things. Now, okay, so it doesn't date that exact piece of stone, but it does give us a nice tie-in, and and all the art historians were pleased to learn that it didn't distract massively from uh, from their predicted timelines of things. So we had a number of uh, very similar interlaces, and just like Come Whitton, where we were looking at this regional interchange of sort of sculptural stuff, of you know clothing of ideas of styles and things like that um workington was the same we saw lots of the interlace you'd find at govern for example lots of uh, commonality with sculpture in the local area and indeed a, a really cool and interesting hogback which has got a perfect parallel two miles up the road across canonby um and it's got the usual sort of tegulation features you might expect of hogbacks on the roof and things like that the only difference is is that the workington one has outward facing beasties on the top of the head whereas they're normally inward facing so uh yeah a bit a bit of an unusual one that and a really really nice find to have because again then they're, they're not particularly common this is kind of a this was a newly discovered hogback so to speak and only because the thing had clearly been smashed to pieces before it was deposited so it was in shattered into little bits which means there's the sculpting on it's absolutely pristine but you know we only have fragments of it luckily because of the cross canopy one and because of the fragments we do have you can kind of reconstruct quite well the form of the thing really so again okay well i mean you you've said hog back there so that's set off <laughs> a, lot of a lot of people will be very interested in that so i mean when i think of hogbacks i think of the 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 amazing collection of five um in glasgow at the the govan stones and in, in, in govan old and we'll, we'll talk about that um so we'll talk about that maybe by 
talking about your interest, and it's not just in Cumbria, it's in that whole sort of northern part of, of what is now England and sort of southern part of, of, of Scotland. What what the Welsh, and I'll probably murder this, I still call to this day your your hen Ogleth, which is oh, the right. old the, the old north. Mm-hmm. And the old north uh is having a lot of influence from uh Scandinavia. And one of the reasons, one of the ways that we think in which this this has come down to us is with these hogback carved stones. Maybe if you can just tell us a little bit about the sort of peoples, maybe to the north of where we are in, in Cumbria, these, these, these Britons that are maybe essentially based around the Clyde Valley for many hundreds of years. Um, and then also what's happening to them at the period of time you're, you're describing. So this Viking age. And you know the influences that are coming in, and and the uh, the, the obviously the military activity that's happening with Scandinavians at that time. That's we think is leading to the this cultural and this sort of political spread of 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 stone sculpture. So maybe just tell us a little bit about your interest in in this this Greater Cumbria, if you will, and then this mm-hmm. this sort of Scandinavian uh, influence on it. Yeah, I mean, what first sort of led me down this line of thinking again was looking at one of the graves at Cumwitton, grave number three, which had a, a sword in there. But we found looking at the x-ray, um, again, I'll send you a picture of the x-ray, that when we looked at the hilt, there was a key pattern motif on inlaid into the pommel of this sword. And it was really unusual compared to some Scandinavian style artworks. And it just... I'd seen this elsewhere, and of course, once I started to trawl through my photo collection, and again, I'll pass some of those over to you, I, I was reminded that this is on Pictish sculpture throughout Scotland. It's on brooches from the Scale Horde, from the Balaquail Horde, from the Isle of Man. It's on bits from Govan. It's on wooden boxes in Dublin. And so this sword, despite being in a Scandinavian appearing grave, very much had this art that was tying it to the region of this, as it does sent me down this kind of rabbit hole looking at this world and of course you you hear the timelines of various countries and they all have their own you know ideas of their heritage and their their history but when you start to look at the 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 brythonic the the brythonic speaking heritage of these areas it seems to have been incorporated into their idea of where these countries came from so the picks are a kind of mysterious kind of origin story for Scotland. And and it's the same in Cumbria to some extent. We we believe that Cumbrian farmers speak Old Norse and all these kind of things. Well, actually, when you look at some of the words they use, they're actually using Brythonic words. And it's the same with a lot of these places. So there's actually this underlying root of these Brythonic peoples there stretching through it all. And, and that's the thing that when Scandinavians move into the area or when other peoples move into the area, these things don't just disappear. They get acculturated and combined into these. So, you know, the sculpture at Govan, which you're very familiar with, has got elements of this Pictish tradition in there and elements of a Scandinavian tradition in there, and they're being woven into a new thing. And I think that's what we're seeing at the, the sword pommel at Cumwitton. You're getting these, you know, things woven together into a, a single, a, a, a new identity, a new thing, really. Um, and it's uh, that's what fascinated me, really. Um, when I started looking at Cumbria in particular, um, very lucky, my friend Fiona Edmonds, who um, is at Lancaster University, so I'm looking over there as if anyone can see it, you know. Where I <laughs> <come from. Yeah. laughs> it's just there, honestly, <laughs> on the hill there. Um, but she'd done a lot of work historically on, on the Kingdom of Strathclyde and talking about how she believed that its foundations as Altclut on the Rock of the Clyde, um, morphing into Stratclut, the Straits of the Clyde, which is where Govan is today, morphing to this kingdom that moves after a, a number of you know, Scandinavian interferences, should we call them politely? You know? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, Adam was referring to, um, we know from the Annals of Ulster, there's a four-month siege, which is you know a, a very rare thing there in medieval period. Um, so the, the basically uh, Vikings put a huge amount of resources into capturing Altclut, which you'll now know today is Dumbarton Rock, which has come through the the, the Gaelic, is uh, fort of the the Britons, but mm-hmm. they're kind of seem to be turfed out of there, and then they kind of have to start their kingdom sort of again. And uh, after that point, it seems to have quite a, for a couple hundred years have quite a big Scandinavian influence on it. But mm-hmm. I, I digress. 
So is that, you know, takeover or is that an inside job mm-hmm. or what? You know, we could debate that ad finitum, couldn't we, really? But looking at that kingdom and, and Fiona believed that this sort of natural progression of that was um, an expansion outwards long term. Um, it doesn't last forever, as these things don't. But at the time in England, in southern and eastern England around the, these events, there's an awful lot of upheaval with most of the nascent Anglo-Saxon kingdoms collapsing and, and Scandinavian takeovers and things like that. So we're looking at the Northwest, which is notionally part of the kingdom of Northumbria, kind of being left to its own devices, really, to some degree, which means there's a bit of a power vacuum there. Um, so this would make sense if there's Scandinavians in the area, whatever happens during that siege at um, Dumbarton, Clearly, there's a bit of a resurgence of Strathclyde afterwards because, you know, there is some growth and some govern looks like a completely revitalized place, as you say, with new sculpture. There's some sculptural affinities with Northern Cumbria. And this is the period we start to see these Scandinavian burials going in in Northern Cumbria. So this is the period of this early 10th century is the period of Cumwitton. It's the period of, you know, um, Aspatia of Hesket. There's even burials at Carlisle Cathedral. So this may be the period that this area has been settled. So the thought was that it's all part one and the same thing. You know, you in effect have um, Strathclyde um, coming down as far as halfway through modern day Cumbria, possibly even further. And that Fiona believes that they may have been, I mean, I'm I'm butchering her words here, so she'll have to forgive me. But, you know, my takeaway was that they were rebranding themselves as Cumbria land. You know, they were trying to re, re-identify because obviously if you're calling yourself the Straits of the Clyde, but reckon Penrith halfway through in Cumbria is part of your modern identity. It's quite a long way away, that really. So rebadging as kind of the, the you know, Cumbrogi, the Cumberland, the, the land of the Cumbrians, it makes a lot of sense. There are, of course, counter arguments to that, really. But then it does fat and fit into this pattern of sculpture and other things. Either way, there's definitely some sort of revitalization of this of this culture, which has got Scandinavian elements, but then elements of, you know, English culture and also Brythonic culture and, and Gaelic culture going on at the time. So and it's a pattern that continues for quite some time. Um Certainly, eventually, there's the Battle of Carham in the early 11th century, which seems to mark something as a high water mark, really, for this, you know, this northern kingdom. Because after then, it definitely seems to disappear off the map fairly shortly afterwards. And um, it's notable to me that actually the this this family that goes in uh, at Workington, for example, in the Kist burials, Carham would be the sort of period they were around for, you know, and then they very shortly disappear after then as does Carham, we know by the middle to the late 11th century that Northumbria is very much a power in the area of Northern Cumbria, again, because there's one document called Gospatrick's Writ, which appears to be from that period, which is basically, interestingly, a Northumbrian nobleman, we believe, called Gospatrick, which in and of itself is interesting because that isn't a Northumbrian English name. (laughs) Sort of giving lands out to a, a character named Thor Finn Mac Thor, who's apparently a resident of this part of Cumbria and, and listing a number of friends and followers who are a mixture of English and Gallic and Brythonic names and just showing the real cultural melting pot of the area. But he's clearly doling out the rights to this land, to this person, suggesting it's back under, you know, Northumbrian or at least, you know, the old of Bamba's authority in that period. So maybe that the family who were there at Workington, who were perhaps on the rise with this Strathclyde kingdom, had fallen out of favour um, by this period, and Northumbria was back in again. Hence, their burial stop, and perhaps that was the period that the uh, Workington was given over to a, a more favourable local family who took over the patronage of the site again. Really, so it's just all looking at this period and its into connectivity there's so many little bits of evidence that we've got no real strong veins of um evidence there but we've got lots of really tantalizing glimpses through things like goss patrick's written sculptural similarities and linguistic elements and stuff that that you know really are sort of hinting at something pretty cool and exciting but never more than hinting irritatingly you know no, and I, I, this is this is. I mean, I, you know, fascinating. And I studied with Fiona many years ago, and she was a she was a, a genius back back then. So I can understand. Yeah, 
our interpretations of what Fiona's saying is probably nothing like, but she has amazing publications out there. Um, and we'll 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 put a list of, of them up as well. Um, along with 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 the Professor Stephen Driscoll at Glasgow. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to find out about uh the Kingdom Strathclyde, there are the resources, there are resources out there that, that you can you can get and also uh, there's a lot of social media activity for for the government stones, which I I I, I know all, all all too well. But one thing you did send me in the notes um, for this was a, a picture of, of a box that seemed to have this key pattern that was both on the the, the sword hilts we were discussing earlier, and I sort of recognise it from uh, the earliest what we think is the earliest hog back at, uh, at Govan that has this pattern. Can you just yeah, tell yeah. us a little bit about that box and just this this again chasing this 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 motif through Strathclyde or whatever yeah yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where you actually start looking at the iconography itself as opposed to just the objects um you get the benefit of being able to look cross materials and not worry too much about it but yeah the, this key pattern i mean there's there's some people who've done some um uh cynthia thickpenny for example has done an excellent sort of study on i think that's available online um on key pattern motifs and would know far more about it than me but it's it is one of those things that's very heavily used in sculpture in the area now it may well have been used on a lot more things because i've seen it on a number of pieces of silver and copper alloy work um including some strap ends from iona for example um some strap ends from shetland um and orkney again some of the huge silver brooches from the hordes that i mentioned so it's clearly been used in metal work um it's clearly been used on sculpture too a lot um but you know it may well have gone around on a lot of organic objects too that we haven't got which is why that box was so interesting so I mean, you can see it in the national museum of ireland it's a little sliding top box most people think of it it's very like a domino box or an old-fashioned pencil case really it's a very tiny little thing don't really know what it's for interestingly the most elaborate decoration on it is on the bottom that is the most sophisticated carving the medium decoration is on the side and the really crude decoration is on the lid so what that means I, I have no idea but the lid motifs and the end motifs as you said the one one of the ones on the lid is almost exactly the same as the cumwit and pommel it's just worked in square instead of in a circle and one of the ones on the end is like a sun wheel style motif almost exactly the same like you said as, as on the uh, hogback from govan so and it's it's not the only place i mean i could if i spent some time i could bring you hundreds of examples of these but it's just tying them all together in terms of this this motif and this iconography i've spoken to a few individuals who sort of study symbolism within this a bit more certainly ross trench jellico believes that the the sort of saltire motif that's on the pommel and stuff like that may well be related to a, you know in effect a christian cross that's what it's it's underlying principle is but it's working it with these key patterns that seem to rotate and devolve around themselves. Um, but that would make a lot of sense in the period. But then isn't that interesting, if that is the case, that it's on the hilt of a sword buried in a Scandinavian burial in a pagan tradition that we uh, believe is being practiced in the, the area. So it's just it's maybe even showing that even then there's a lot more. It's a bit like Sutton Who Burial. There's a lot more muddied messages in there from a belief point of view once you start getting into them and you know i always say that it's, it's interesting thinking about pagan paganism because it's devo default position is that gods multiple gods exist so for a pagan to accept additional gods is not difficult because their default status is open door it's just which is the more powerful ones for example so i don't suppose it was very hard for a, a, a pagan scandinavian to add to their pantheon with an additional god you know um whereas it, that's not the case with other religions which are monotheistic so i always think i always think that that's maybe why we start to see things like this creeping in there because it's like that you know that particular god seems to be quite good maybe we'll have a bit of that maybe even a sword like that was a gift you know if these are scandinavian settlers in cumbria perhaps they're being given things like this sword by an overlord who is tied directly to strathclyde you know, and the sword is a gift from that overlord. And as a result, it's got regional decoration on it. We're often bemoaning, and we both do, the lack of fines from Strathclyde, from Cumbria. Mm. But what what we what are we looking for? Where are we looking for? Yeah. This particular sword doesn't fit very well in the Scandinavian sword typology. 
it's quite similar to some of the ser types or things like that but when we struggled in the book to find it well what do we think a strathclyde sword might look like i don't think it would be that vastly different to other northwest european swords because that isn't the pattern we see we see developments and iterations on other northwest european swords so maybe one that looks a bit like some of the english and scandinavian swords but is different and also has an overlay in a very regional style maybe that's it right there and of course it's sitting in a scandinavian grave because by and large that's how a lot of the material culture from the ninth century is being preserved in this part of the world you know we don't know what an anglo-saxon shield boss likes because by this period you know in the ninth 10th century they're not burying them in graves with people anymore so we don't know what one looks like particularly but we do have some weird shield bosses being buried in scandinavian graves in scotland and ireland and northwest england that don't seem to fit in the typologies there so Maybe that's an Anglo-Saxon shield boss that somebody's carried up there. You know, we we do have this weird thing with archaeology in that we think we see patterns, but we don't know what we're missing a lot of the time. Well, um, I always fear that I'm going to over-deliver when I deliver the intros for these podcasts, but I think Adam kindly uh, lent to us by Oxford Archaeology, um, absolutely delivered. Um, Viking cemeteries, I love the Vikings, as you know all too well and yeah i think even as a non-viking i'd be like this this is what i want a viking cemetery to look like it's it's got the sort of quote-unquote warrior burials but it's also got the sort of non-warrior burials as well so it's got it's got all the aspects of society and i think we're talking about society seeing cumbria at that time as this brilliant multicultural sort of mix of British, Viking, Anglo-Saxon, Irish, Irish Sea region. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's everything. And I, I I mean, I love just finishing on that discussion on um, you know, this this you know, what this world was and all of the links and the connections between it. And I I don't know if that was the same for you, Luke. Yeah, no, it was I think this was a great podcast for lots of different reasons. I think Adam's a great speaker. He you can see he He's very knowledgeable. Not only that, he seems to really love what he's talking about. As do you, you can see that you both get excited about these things and it makes me excited listening to it as well. But it's fascinating the finding stuff like that is what I'm interested in. How do you feel? I assume when you're digging something like this, coming across something like this, and then you find a body that's been impaled through the heart and stuff like that. Like that's That must be just an absolute... The moment of finding something like that must be incredible. Yeah, it's, I mean, you get that everyone else says, you know, it's the first time someone has seen this for a thousand, two thousand, you know, X thousands of years. So so there's that. And then if you multiply that by something weird or unexpected yeah. has happened, it just, it, you know, the, it, it is to the power, you know, power 10 of, of that just initial, this is, this everything we do is quite cool. And then it just raises it. And you know, to, to get a chance to get an insight into someone's life and and you know and and death as well is you know it does it does take you back. I think I always find when when you're on sites like you could be like a second world warrior aircraft site or something like that, and then you do have to sometimes take a moment and think, you know, these are because you know you know roughly the age of the skeletons, things like that, and you think, well, this person's younger than me. You know, um, and it, it, you know, it, it's very easy to say, oh, yeah, yeah it affected me, but it, it kind of does. You do a sort of thing, oh, yeah, so this person has, you know, suffered some horrible sword wound or, uh, yeah. you know, has, has, has crashed into a mountain in, a, in an aircraft. And it's, yeah, you, you do, you do think about more than you would think. And it's not just when you're, say, sort of posting about it or talking about it and things like that. You do, I often think back to, 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 you know, especially when it's younger people that you're discovering or people that have had violent deaths. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, and it, again, it just reminds you what a privilege, privilege it is to do this job, whether, whether research or commercial, it's archaeology is just, a, just a, a privilege to do. The other question I had for you on this was uh, this, things being found by metal detectorists. Mm. I saw this come up in the news over here in Ireland recently that I think they've introduced a fine for, I think it's illegal to get metal detectors in Ireland without a license anyway, but there's been a fine introduced for people who use metal detectors and don't um, don't acknowledge or don't report that they've found 
something historical or an archaeological find or whatever. Uh, what are your views on that or the archaeological community on that, that this was this amazing thing was found by metal detectorists who reported it, obviously? Yeah, and, and that's it. Um, and whether it's with Portable Antiquity Scheme, which is in Eng England and Wales, um, I think Northern Ireland as well, and then you've got Treasure Trove mm -hmm. in, in Scotland. You know, what, what you want to do is, yeah, it's like anything, you've got to be a responsible archaeologist and you've got to be responsible metal detectorists as, as well. So, you know, if you're going on land, you've got to have an agreement with the landowner. Um, and what you've then got to do is, you know, responsible thing to do. And often the legal thing that you have to do, depending on what you find, is to to report it to 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 one of those schemes. And, you know, I think what people will find out is, you know, if people are doing it for, for money or doing it for fame, and most people are doing it because they're just like us, fascinated in archaeology, the, the, the best way to get money, fame, but then also, you know, give back to the local and international community, I say, depending on the find, is to have it reported because, you know, a collection of coins that you can sell with, with no provenance is, it, you know, it's some, it's some old silver or gold. But if you know it's part of a hoard, if you stop when you discover the first of those few coins and say get it block lifted and report it to your local uh, finds liaison officer, for example, um, or or report it to Treasure Trove. Um, and often cases, you know, I won't go into legals here because people will know and you can find out on their on their websites. Um, it, it should be reported. But if you get the experts in at that point, um, then they could do micro excavations and they can discover actually not all the coins were put in at the same time. There, and you can sometimes see individual, say, a toss of a certain, you know, three or four coins that are still so tightly packed together. And you know that, OK, so this wasn't just say one panicked, um, you know, the Vikings are coming, we need to put all these coins away, it might be like, this is a family putting money there over, say, generations. And, you know, so you need, the more information you have, the the the, the better for, you know, obviously knowledge and for the community. But then often, if it's a spectacular find, then, you know, say the government or whoever uh, will 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 buy it, and then the 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 responsible message textures will share that with with the la the landowner, and that's usually sort of the legal agreement. And of course, I'm not talking of outside the uh, the Republic of Ireland, which the the laws are very very different. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think yeah, you've just got to whatever you go into that field, you know, you you've got to in advance know what laws are, and you've got to obviously have your agreement with the landowner. And if it looks like you're finding something that's you know under the 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 purview of the the I, either the schemes, then yeah, you legally have to report them because you will get sent to jail if you if you yeah. do something that's that's illegal and it's and it's it's you know it's that critical. So it's not only about being responsible with it, but also like we're trying to do, get the story out there of what you found and um and that's what the reporting is about. That's what we're doing. We're reporting other people's stories here. And if you want to hear or see more of that, hit follow, hit subscribe, give us a rating, give us a review. Tell your friends who might be interested in the shindig uh, to come and listen or watch us. Uh, we're available on YouTube. We're available on Spotify. We're available on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. So make sure to click that link so that we can come right into your ears every time there's a nice little podcast out. And I'll just leave it for me to say th thank you for listening on behalf of uh, Luke, myself and the, the Red River Archaeology Group. And we hope to see you soon. Thanks, guys. <laughs>